The essential aim of polythetic assessment is to provide a way of making judgments about things which might be good or bad, but good or bad in many different ways. The point is, if we can do this, then we can free ourselves from rigid categories like learning outcomes and that kind of thing, and embrace the richness of creativity in the diverse things that individuals do and make defensible judgments about them. Well, what we do normally is we take the entire sample of things that we want to make comparisons about, so it may be student work, and we identify particular variables which are common across all of them. And then we use these variables to determine which are the best and which are the worst. This approach is called monothetic. It basically means that we group and order things together according to a common set of variables. You can think about monothetic judgment as applying to the children's game of Guess Who. So in Guess Who, we have uh, faces that are presented to children, and those faces have certain categories which relate to them. So for example, it could be the gender of the person, or their clothing, or whether they've got hair. But all the faces that are presented actually are belonging to a single class of people. Whether you've got hair, a hat, glasses, or a moustache, you're still a person and you belong to the person category where all of those variables can be represented. A polythetic cluster, on the other hand, is a group of things which belong together in ways which we can't necessarily put our finger on. There isn't a common set of variables that can be identified across the whole set. And when we think about the judgments that we make about our favourite music or the things that make us happy, these are effectively polythetic judgments that we make which don't fit a monothetic scheme. So think about, for example, what makes you happy. Now whatever variables might be identified among the things that can make you happy, they have very, very complex interrelationships. Happiness, obviously, can be produced in many possible ways, with many different kinds of variables entering into the equation. But all these variables combine to produce the same result over time. And one of the key differences between polythetic assessment and monothetic assessment is that polythetic assessment embraces time, and monothetic assessment excludes it. The messiness of the interaction between complex variables in a polythetic judgment is very hard for humans to process. Nevertheless, we've been quite successful at taking very messy categories and producing monothetic categories, which try to embrace, although imperfectly, the messiness of the situation. And this is where we see things like learning outcomes emerge. And in fact, more recently, our machine learning technology is engaged in precisely this kind of operation of trying to take messy situations and identify common categories across the mess of the interaction between variables. Of course, the side effect of this is that time is excluded in what we do with our machine learning and in what we do with our attempts to force a monothetic categorization over a polythetic phenomenon. So there are two questions here, really. On the one hand, we have to ask, well, why does reducing messy things to simple variables sometimes work? Why does our machine learning work? What is it about this reduction process that actually sometimes delivers uh, meaningful results to us? And the second question is, how does this work generally? How do a variety of different conditions of different variables produce similar outcomes? How does that work? Now, what I want to say is that actually the answer to both of these questions is the same thing. This is a, an extract from a, a diary entry by Ross Ashby, who was one of the founding figures in cybernetics, and he argued that to recognize a class is to throw away information. And so what he's basically saying is that the, the monothetic um, process of reducing things to categories is actually a process of getting rid of stuff. It's, it's, it's just saying, oh no, we're only going to focus on this particular category and we're not going to deal with anything else. So reducing to simple variables means discarding information. And all forms of monothetic um, assessment throw away information. So that's Ashby's statement. But actually behind Ashby's statement is that the stuff that we throw away, effectively we make it disappear. We turn it into nothing. So the ability to turn things into nothing sits behind our ability to reduce messiness and complexity to simple variables. The answer to question two is much deeper in a sense, but it also relates to nothing. So how do a variety of conditions produce similar outcomes? Well, if the reason why 
we are able to reduce complex and messy situations to simple variables is because we're able to turn those things that don't fit in those categories into nothing, we probably should ask whether many variables can contribute to the same outcome because all those variables in some way are working towards nothing over a process of time. And time must be an integra integral part of that process. So just to summarize, just at this stage, nothing sits behind the reason why our throwing away of information works and we can reduce things to simple categories and nothing explains why so many different variables can produce the same effect. A very simple example is that you can imagine um, uh, multiple variables interacting with one another in such a way that periodically they cancel each other out and just disappear. And with each disappearance, something new is born. This is a very, almost a biological um, idea. This is a very simple mathematical simulation called Conway's Game of Life. The dynamics of Conway's Game of Life are precisely a kind of dynamics of different variables interacting with each other in such a way that they cancel each other out. So behind this way of thinking about nothing, the principle of cancelling oneself out is absolutely fundamental. Now in nature, we do see things which seem to cancel themselves out. In physics, for example, there's a subatomic particle called the Majorana fermion, which is its own antiparticle. And when the particle meets itself, both particles disappear. This seems deeply confusing and counterintuitive to us, because we live in a world of numbers which continually increase. But what if you could get numbers to cancel themselves out in the same way that the Majorana fermion cancels itself out? Well, this is something which has been explored by a physicist called Peter Rowlands. And I want to explain how Peter has illustrated the importance of nothing as an operating principle throughout the universe and used a mathematical technique developed in the 19th century to create what is called a nil potent, which is where an algebraic expression multiplied by itself can be shown to produce zero. The importance of this apparently simple idea is that Peter can then show how the algebraic expression might relate to either Newton's laws of motion or Dirac's equations for quantum mechanics or Einstein's equation for mass and energy. Nothing, it seems, runs all the way through the universe. There's a very simple way of explaining Rowland's mathematics. It basically involves a Pythagorean triangle, where the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. So if the hypotenuse is A, and the other two sides are B and C, then you can say that A squared minus B squared minus C squared is zero. So can that equation be factorized in such a way that something multiplied by itself can represent a squared minus b squared minus c squared and in turn represent zero? The answer is yes, but in order to do this, Peter has exploited a powerful mathematical idea that was invented by William Rowan Hamilton called the Quaternions. And I'm going to explain now how we can get from a squared minus b squared minus c squared to zero by multiplying something by itself. Once we can do this, we then have an algebraic formula that we can map on to observed phenomena. And because that algebraic formula demonstrates the principle of nothingness, we can use this technique as a way of making polyphetic phenomena more tractable. So let's look at Peter's equation. He says that a squared minus b squared minus c squared can be factorized as ika plus ib plus jc all squared is equal to zero. We can see from the equation that we've got a, b, and c, but we're not clear what the i's, k's, and j's are all about. And then it seems confusing because one of the i's is in bold and another one isn't. Now this is because the bold letter i, j, k's are part of Hamilton's quaternion system. Now the quaternions are 3D imaginary numbers where i squared equals minus 1, j squared equals minus 1, and k squared equals minus 1. But there's also the i which isn't bold, and that's an ordinary imaginary number, which is just the square root of minus 1. But the key to this equation is the inclusion of the quaternions. Now, quaternions are very interesting complex numbers because they exist in three dimensions, and they rotate in the way that they multiply with each other. So, for example, we can conceive of i, j, and k 
as three vectors working on the x, y and z axis shown here in the diagram. If I multiply the j vector by the i vector, so I have i times j, it actually creates a new vector which moves towards k. So i times j is k. If I do the same thing and I multiply the k vector by the i vector, so I have k times i, I actually produce a vector that moves towards the j vector. And again, if I multiply j by k, then I move towards i. So, so the quaternions are very useful for producing a kind of rotational symmetry. But even more interesting is the fact that if you reverse their order, they don't produce the same result, which is completely unlike how we normally think about multiplication. We think that multiplication is commutative, and the quaternions are anti-commutative. It's this anti-commutativity which makes Peter's equation work. So I'm just going to take you through now multiplying out the brackets of this equation to prove that a squared minus b squared minus c squared can indeed be factorised by ika plus ib plus jc all squared. So how do we do it? Well the first step is to say ika plus ib plus jc squared is two brackets each including ika plus ib plus jc. Now if we multiply out the brackets then we first of all we get three terms which are just squared. So we have ika squared, ib squared plus jc squared. But then we have to multiply across all the different terms that are left. So we have ib times ika plus ika times ib plus jc times ika plus ika times jc plus jc times ib plus ib times jc. And you think, okay, how on earth does all of that just disappear? Well, this is what happens. If you notice, in the cross terms to start with, we have an i times k, and then we have a k times i. And if we look at our multiplication table of quaternions, we see that ki is j, and ik is minus j. So this is basically adding and taking away the same number. What happens if we do that? It disappears. Let's look at the second cross term. So we've got j times k plus k times j. Looking at the table again, we can see that jk is i and kj is minus i. So that is basically plus i i times ac minus i i times ac. It disappears. And the final term, the final cross term also disappears. So that leaves us with ika squared plus ib squared plus jc squared. And guess what? When we start to square these numbers, they also disappear. i squared is minus 1. k squared is also minus 1. Minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1. And that means that we just have a squared. The second term, ib squared. Well, i squared is minus 1. So ib squared is just minus b squared. And you can probably see where this is going to go now because j squared is also minus 1. And we have minus c squared. And we have our original equation and it equals zero. So the magic of the quaternions means that Peter makes a trip round the triangle and gets absolutely nowhere. Now, as I mentioned, the importance of this work is the fact that this algebraic trick can be mapped on to so many, so many of the fundamental equations in nature. So it's not just Newton that tells us for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Einstein's mass-energy-momentum equation is of a very similar form to the Pythagorean equation we've just been looking at. It can be factorised in exactly the same way. What does that mean? It means that mass, energy and momentum is fundamentally nilpotent. Zero is the driving force. More than this, Dirac's equation in quantum mechanics, which describes the spin of subatomic particles like electrons and quarks, can also be expressed in this way. And in doing this, what Rowlands has done is create a unifying framework for dealing with theories in physics which have puzzled scientists for decades because they seem to be incompatible. But it doesn't stop there, because these ideas also apply to the biological domain, and by extension we can explore how they can be applied to education and learning. So at the heart of the polythetic technique is a deep knowledge of mathematics which reflects a deep understanding of physics and biology.
The patterns of production of zero at different levels of organization is something we see in fractals. And fractals are incredibly important in our processes of knowledge and understanding. Because in our processes of communicating with each other and engaging with our environment, our ability to anticipate what's likely to happen next based on our understanding of what's happened in the past is fundamental. And the only way we have the ability to anticipate what's likely to happen next is if what has happened before has a similar pattern to what might happen next. Without nothing, there is no pattern. Applied to education, this is completely liberating because our theories of education really depend on biological knowledge as it was established nearly a hundred years ago. So what's involved in exploiting these nilpotent equations in our empirical observations in biology or in learning? Well, it really comes down to fundamental variables of i, j, and k alongside the imaginary numbers and the real numbers. Using this algebraic scheme, we can map i, j, k, imaginary and real numbers onto real observable phenomena. In physics, it might be mass, space, time, and charge. In biology, it might be the nuclear bases in DNA. But whichever variables are mapped, we can show the mathematics of the quaternions reveal how patterns of rotational symmetry are generated through processes whereby different levels of interaction between these variables produce zero at different levels of organization. This idea is particularly important in our understanding of evolution and biology. The evolutionary biologist John Torday has argued that it is the cell which is the fundamental building block of life. Cells, he argues, have to organize themselves to cope with the ambiguity and uncertainty of the environment within which they seek to survive. And they do this by communicating with each other. In the process of communicating and organizing themselves, three fundamental variables are involved, which he calls the first principles of physiology. Perhaps not surprisingly, these three fundamental principles of physiology can be related to Peter Rowland's quaternion system for understanding how different levels of organization work. In arguing for the fundamental importance of the cell and its communication, Torday raises similar questions to those addressed by Peter Rowland's. Why is it, for example, that diseases manifest themselves in symptoms which appear to be closely related but distributed across different biological systems in the body. So, for example, eczema and asthma are closely related conditions, but one affects the lung and the other the skin. But also, similar conditions apply across species. And similar biological phenomena can be observed at different levels of evolutionary organization. The most interesting aspect of this with respect to education is that disease appears to be a form of cellular regression, that the cell regresses to a previous stable state in its evolutionary history. And that the ultimate stable state in evolutionary history is the beginning of time and nothing. This raises the possibility that educational problems, both at an individual and an institutional level, can be similarly characterized by a regressive process. Similarly, educational advancement can be seen as evolutionary progression as one level of complexity and production of zero gives rise to a new and more sophisticated level of complexity which also produces zero. Finally, how can this be empirically operationalized? Well, it comes down to a process of making measurements in such a way that patterns at different levels of organization can be studied and compared. The polythetic technique looks for underlying patterns which unite processes of creativity and different levels of experience. One technique is to use ideas from information theory and look at the information entropies of different aspects of experience and different aspects of conversation and creativity. The process of analysis is not dissimilar to processes of analyzing music. Music displays precisely the kind of polythetic organization that may underpin the way nature is structured in its entirety. Indeed, the word polythetic and polyphonic are very closely related. And one of the early champions of a polythetic understanding was the sociologist and phenomenologist Alfred Schutz, who used it to describe the experience of music. So to be able to study education polythetically, to make polythetic judgments, is to make ourselves more musical in the way that we look at the world and the way that we make comparisons about things. In other words, polythetic assessment gives us a way of healing the rift 
between the arts and the sciences, making our scientific judgments fundamentally aesthetic.